Cool. So uh, I'm going to present about, uh, well, this is a fairly introductionary presentation on uh, well, some tips and tricks that may become useful to you working uh, at Pagoda on near core or any of the adjacent libraries, uh, crates. Um, this is roughly just a collection of what I thought might be useful to you. Uh, ultimately, there are so many things to keep in mind that uh, definitely not all of them will fit. Um, so at the end, I'm going to put some links to places where we keep our exhaustive uh, guidance and suggestions. Uh, but still, anyhow, it's kind of probably useful to have this uh, presentation just describing you what the reasoning behind those ideas are. So just to kick things off the ground, let's talk about correctness. We care about correctness a lot at Near at Pagoda. Uh, if things go wrong for whatever reason, that's going to be bad for the chain. Uh, we may have some sort of a vulnerability uh, that may cause an outage or uh, somebody's token getting stolen. And uh, we all know how that goes really. Uh, there, are not, there have been plenty of projects so far that have suffered uh, in one way or another and had their token value just collapsing or just the entire project going poof uh, because somebody, something wrong went. So ensuring correctness of our code is one of those things that we must do, uh, keep in mind that we, uh, all the time as we develop uh, near core. <clears throat> so the way uh, arithmetic, let's talk about arithmetic then. The way arithmetics are approached uh, are very similar between all kinds of languages and Rust is not uh, an exception here. Uh, we do have a uh, operator like a plus or minus. Uh, we put that in between two variables A and B uh, and out comes the sum uh, or the difference or the multiplication result uh, that you can then assign to a variable uh, and use it for for the computation. <clears throat> Python does have some additional uh, operators that uh, are not displayed here. So like, for example, exponentation, uh, which is represented by double star. Uh, and in converse, programming languages as Haskell has chosen to not assign a, sim uh, a symbol to operations such as, um, such as remainder. So you see an empty window here. Uh, but by far and large, uh, similarities are abundant. Um, but well, I wouldn't be really talking about arithmetics and operators if they were really that straightforward, right? Uh, so let's take a, a look at an example. In this example, I uh, define the test case uh, with a uh, hashtag uh, and then, I don't know which braces these are, the pointy braces. Uh, and between the pointy braces, we have test uh, that makes a function, uh, a test function that gets one when you run a cargo test. Uh, and within this, I'm going to uh, define some specification for the function that I'm going to implement a little bit later. And the intent is to have a uh, function which gets a element from the end of the list uh, given the index. So uh, given the list that is one, two, three, at index zero, there's gonna be three. So the last element at index two, we're gonna have one, which is the first element. And uh, higher indexes are out of bounds. So we're gonna be returning none. <clears throat> and to implement this, uh, I kind of intentionally made a mistake here in a comparison operator uh, just to demonstrate the point. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I feel like this code is something that anybody could have written uh, and made this min mistake generally without realizing it, uh, where you just use the wrong comparison operator instead of uh, more and equal than uh, length, we used more than length. Uh, and we will see, uh, and then we later use uh, these variables in a computation, which does, uh, which subtracts from the length of the array, the index and minus one because, uh, this is zero indexed. So if you have a length of 
three and index is two, then you need to, to get a index of zero, you still need to subtract a one. Uh, and before we go into that and aside, the couple of ways you can run this example. Uh, one way is you can create a query, put this code into LibRS and invoke cargo test. Uh, this will work more, a lot of the time, uh, especially works well when you have uh, a dependency on an external query. Uh, it also uh, works better if you have a complicated text example uh, that you want to try out. But for this case, for example, when our test case is just a single function or two uh, with a, a test function as well, it can be easier to just compile it to trust C directly. Uh, this works great if you don't need any other queries other than the standard library, such as the case right here. Uh, or alternatively, we can use the Rust Playground, which is a uh, website where you can prototype and play with code. Uh, some of the potential benefits of using that are the fact that you can share links to the code uh, example with to anybody else. Uh, and I will be doing this, uh, the same throughout this presentation. So as you are looking uh, to the notes and to the presentation, feel free to click on any of these links to look at the code uh, directly, uh, run the code, uh, experiment with it, change it, see how it behaves and uh, yeah, that pretty much uh, do definitely explore the functionality that this tool uh, makes available to you because it is fairly uh, featureful. So going back into the arithmetic operations, this uh, fails. Well, as I explained uh, a little bit previously, I kind of intentionally fudged with the comparison operator there. Uh, so what happened was that uh, now we are subtracting the uh, total length of the array uh, such that it eventually ends up overflowing. So in this case, uh, we are subtracting from zero a minus one. And what happens is, uh, well, it goes below zero and unsigned integers cannot represent that very well. Here I kind of highlighted the areas where the mistake has occurred. Uh, I could fix this code by changing the comparison operator to be the correct one, uh, so greater than or equal. But I think there is definitely a better approach there that uh, was towards you and is not really available in other languages or as common at least. Uh, and this is to use methods that the Rust standard library provides to apply various checked operation. So it does provide more than just checking. It can ultimately the list of operators that are av made available to you are addition, subtraction, multiplication, the various uh, typical arithmetic operation that you might expect. And each of them have a uh, multiple different handling modes. So in this case, we are using check, uh, which verifies that uh, the operation will not overflow. And if it does overflow, it returns a num. Otherwise, it returns a sum that you can extract the computation value out of it. Uh, the question mark marked in orange uh, then unwraps this result if it was none, it returned from the function. If it was some, it just gives you the uh, result of subtraction, the difference back. Uh, some other handling, mode of handling, handling are thing called saturation. So for example, <clears throat> if subtracting from uh, a number would result in a number less than zero for unsigned numbers, uh, in the end, the result would become zero overall, you won't have to deal with uh, none or some wrapping, but it has some different uh, semantics, right? So you need to think about which one, uh, which mode of handling is uh, most appropriate for you. Marked in blue, I also use a different method called get, uh, instead of indexing a vector uh, or a slide directly. Uh, this method similarly is a uh, 
checking method in that instead of panicking when uh, the index is out of bound, it uh, returns a sum or none. It wasn't strictly appropriate in this example, I would say, because uh, in this case, if the index is out of bound of the slide that we are trying to index, uh, it's a programming error, a logic error in this function. And so uh, arguably panicking might have been a better idea really, uh, mostly because we have already checked for the indexing uh, indices uh, beforehand with checked sub function. <clears throat> Let's talk about a related uh, operation, which is casts. Uh, they, I feel, uh, share a fair amount of similar pitfalls as a uh, typical arithmetic but at least they do not panic when you overflow or do something wrong with them. Uh, they typically default to uh, handling the problem by wrapping around. Uh, and if you are not expecting this to happen, this can be a, this can cause a logic error on its own. So yeah, intuitively you would want to use the very basic syntax that is made available in Rust, which is value as B, B being a type that you want to convert to. Uh, but I do think there's a better approach here. Uh, but before that, so here's a list of, or a table that I prepared uh, that demonstrates which cats are lossless. So they do not suffer from the problem that I just described. So you always can cast to the type that is itself. So if a number is u8, uh, an unsigned 8-bit integer, then casting it to an unsigned 8-bit integer is always going to succeed. And so it will succeed if you cast it to a larger unsigned integer, such as say u16 or u128 or u size. Uh, on the other hand, if you cast u8 to an signed 8-bit integer, now it's going to be a little bit more tricky because uh, if you have a uh, value such as a 255, which is the maximum that unsigned 8-bit integer can hold, uh, a signed 8-bit integer cannot hold it. So you get, uh, you're going to get a wrap around and the actual value that will be stored is going to be minus 1, which is not probably not what you might have wanted. Uh, so, in order to deal with that, uh, much like with uh, the method for arithmetics, the standard library provides some trays, uh, such as from and into, uh, for conversion that cannot fail, or between between type that cannot fail. So, if you have a U8, uh, you can be sure that uh, if you call dot into on to, on that value. Uh, the conversion will always be successful and lossless to the whatever type you are converting uh, this way. Uh, similarly, for type that uh, do not implement from an into and uh, thus the conversions are not lossless, they also try from and try into methods. Uh, those do the checking for the potential overflow within themselves. So you don't really need to worry about implementing that correctly uh, by open coding it, uh, much like I demonstrated with uh, arithmetic uh, operation that can become a problem when you, for example, mistakenly use a, a wrong kind of uh, comparison operator. So what we have uh, looked at so far, if you find yourself open coding checks on the arithmetic operations uh, cast, your code may be better uh, off if it, if you replaced uh, those operations with a method like check sub or a conversion uh, trait such as from, try from, into, try into. Um, similarly, if you find yourself open coding checks around indexing, uh, you may be better served by a method such as say slice, colon, colon, get. And in general, I would say uh, typically this, uh, kind of pattern applies to many different things. So like if you find yourself open coding something, there might very well be a method that already does this for you and uh, implement to check internally. So you don't really need to 
worry about getting the details right. It doesn't always make 100% sense to apply those methods indiscriminately. So as I have this, uh, explained with uh, uh, indexing with get, for example, uh, using a proper indexing uh, that panics may have been better there because uh, it would have caught any potential implementation uh, mistake within the function that we were implementing. And use Rust Playground to prototype, share snippets, uh, play with code, experiment with it. Uh, it's a fairly easy and convenient way to do it. And finally, uh, test attribute for lightweight unit tests, uh, very uh, common in Rust code. Uh, do definitely read on that because we use that throughout our near core code base very extensively as well. Let's talk about expressions, loops, and structured go to. So, unlike many other languages that you may have encountered before Rust, uh, Rust is a very expression oriented language. And by expression, I mean that the expressions are things that produce a result, or you may be used to a uh, term such as an R value, right value, uh, value that ap appears on the right side of an assignment operator. Uh, so in these other languages, you Things like uh, arithmetic, so you have uh, A plus B, that's an expression. Uh, in Rust, many more things are expressions as well. So in this example you see here, uh, we are writing this code in a fairly non-expression-wise way. So both and silence are an expression uh, that is assigned to the result. Uh, the result is a variable uh, that is being assigned to, and we eventually print it but there is a better way to write this. With being an expression-oriented language, if is also an expression. So both bodies of it, whichever executes uh, the last expression within it is also a result of the if expression as a whole. So instead of worrying whether the result has been assigned and uh, you might have forgotten to assign to it in one of the branches, right? Uh, if you write the code this way, you won't forget because ultimately the Rust then will check, oh, hey, if I am in the uh, truth branch, then I am expecting this to return a string, but also I'm expecting this to produce a string in the else branch as well. So uh, in case you forget, the compiler will remind you. And it's all, I would say, pretty much always recommended to uh, see if you can write uh, your code this way rather than the other way um, just so because it's a little bit more rusty uh, a little bit more uh, check gonna be applied to your code uh, and it, the semantic analysis that was does execute on your code will have an easier time proving that your code is in fact correct um, and to extend on this idea, loop is also an expression. And by loop, I, I mean here the loop, a loop statement expression in Rust rather than like loops in general, such as a while or for loops. Uh, so if you ever find yourself writing some sort of a search algorithm or something along those lines and have a result, a result variable out of line, outside of this loop that you would eventually assign the result to, uh, you may have a easier time if you replace this with a lower level limit, primitive, which is just the basic loop. Uh, and that because when you break out of it, you have an opportunity to provide the value uh, that will then become a result of the loop expression as a whole. So in this example, we are breaking out of the loop with break 42 and eventually the result also become 42 because that's how loops work and rust. Um, to further on that idea even more, um, 
you can actually implement a structure control flow with this and use that as an as a replacement for go to statement that are available in C or C++ and although those specific statements are very heavily discouraged because they are very difficult to reason about uh, that's not really the case in Rust because due to the structured nature you cannot really jump to an arbitrary location from another arbitrary location it enforces some specific rule that make uh, such a control flow much easier to reason about uh, so in this example we have a while loop that is uh, checking a done variable uh, which is a search so whenever we find a value we will assign the done uh, to true and then eventually this while loop will also stop uh, the problem with this piece of code is that every iteration we are checking on a variable uh, and if we had an access to go to if it was not heavily discouraged or something then well technically we could jump out of this loop immediately after we are we have found our value that would potentially make the code more efficient although uh, optimizers are probably pretty good at optimizing this particular pattern uh, but well demonstration purposes call for uh, simplification because uh, slides do not really have much space for them uh, for extensive pieces of code so we will have to work with this <clears throat> so in rust you can instead use uh, labels and uh, break again to basically terminate the loop in any place within that loop so that would make these control con uh, these control flow contracts structured so you cannot really break into this loop from some other location by calling break out uh, from somewhere else in your code it's only gonna work within a loop that you're already breaking out of and if you look at this example in particular you will notice that this is still a nested loop so uh, we have this outer loop that we have labeled but then uh, we also within the execute a for loop and you will notice that this break outer statement will break out of these two loops together so if you ever find yourself in a situation where you do want to have a behavior like that uh, consider just adding a label to your uh, loop or a block blocks also work fine you can do that uh, with a while loop or for loop as well just slap a uh, prime outer or prime whatever name you want just a, like a lifetime colon before your uh, semi statement the loop or while loop or for loop or block or anything like that uh, and you will have an opportunity then to uh, break out of it uh, wherever you are within it So, uh, next on the list of topics is a namespacing. This came up in a fairly recent discussion on Zulip that we had, uh, where people were asking, how should I approach namespacing? And I felt like this is a fairly good topic to cover in this presentation as well. So, where I'm coming from. Readability, I feel, is, fairly, is always more important than uh, ease of writing the code for the first time and that because well you mostly write the code once maybe you modify it twice and then every time you look at it again it's gonna be reading it so optim the way you should optimize for this is for the reading experience rather than from, from the writing or modification perspective um, and with that in mind, using partially qualified names, uh, I feel like they can really help with readability and understandability of the code. Uh, mostly just because you don't really need to go back to the top of the file to look at like, okay, what has been imported into this file and what this variable or name really refers to. So instead you can just write apple colon colon pi or raspberry colon colon pi sorry about that and people will be able to tell 
that oh hey this is coming from the apple crate or this one uh, this other use is coming from the raspberry crate or module or whatever and they will not need to have this contextual knowledge of where this code is or what the file has already imported to actually understand what this code really does or means um implementing display is a perfect example that i come across uh specifically in this local reasoning from this local reasoning perspective so i might imp uh, import std colon colon fmt format uh, at the top of the file but think about what would happen if i uh, actually imported all of the things within it that i used so display result formatter uh, maybe formatter is one of those things that uh, are not really all that ambiguous uh, it's formatter, so it's probably gonna come from the module intended library called format, right? Uh, display is also a fairly uh, common name that you might want to import, but think about the result. There are uh, multiple, or use the name result in Rust is fairly common. This result might refer to many different things. It might refer to a local alias uh, that you have defined it might refer to uh, the typical thing that you import from the standard library to its prelude by not importing anything, which has this uh, the two parameters for the OK value or the error value. Or well, it might refer to this uh, result alias imported from the formatting library. So I would argue that having just FMT colon colon result in the return position here is just making the code significantly more understandable without much loss and like ability or speed you write the code really like it's five additional characters it's not really all that hard right so definitely consider thinking about like just how deep uh, or how deep do you want to import right what point does it make to um actually if it would make potentially to qualify this code and the way i personally approach this is i write the code largely qualified to the to the point where i think makes sense all the time and then when i find opportunities to unqualify it so to import names uh a little bit more specifically at the top of the file then i will use uh the id uh rust analyzer to actually replace the uh use of the name with the import and the shortened name instead on the other in the other direction you can use uh use to simplify the match pattern so for example uh as we have in here we do repeat the word by a huge number of times right uh, it's not really giving much value to us if we knew that this is a pi for the first match uh, for the first pattern we probably will know that it is a pi for the next three right we will remember as we read the code since it is fairly local to the to this code itself right so it's not like gonna go to the next area of the file by itself and so the thing that you can do is actually just above the match import the all of the variants of the pi enum in this case uh, that will let you simplify your match patterns a little bit uh, you will be able to say oh hey apple raspberry uh, blueberry without prefixing that necessarily with the word pi that is not giving much uh, additional information to you and even then, if you do this, uh, the import of the variant is fairly local to this match statement, right? Because it's just above it. So it's probably not going to get lost or uh, be confusing in that kind of context. So the second checkpoint. Uh, the code is written once or maybe a couple times, and uh, then later it's going to be read many times over. So uh, definitely optimize for the later uh, 
it definitely makes most sense, at least to me, and I think it probably does make sense to uh, apply this kind of reasoning in general. Uh, Rust does have a concept of structured go-to uh, and an ability to set results uh, to expressions uh, that are not expressions in other languages. So uh, that may enable you to simplify the code or write it in ways uh, that are much more readable than in other languages. Uh, I find that using loop, for example, is giving me like a light bulb above my head in terms of, oh, hey, I can do that. And it makes the code like just a pleasure to read as well. Similarly, on the readability topic, Rust namespaces, Rust namespaces are neat, uh, but it is important just to consider the context and to try a diff couple different things out to see the best way to apply them. Uh, importing all the things to the their like most deep level is not necessarily the best approach all the time sometimes applying some name pacing uh, partial qualification is uh, a good idea and make the code easier to understand sometimes it is uh, that you want to actually qualify or import things that you wouldn't necessarily import like variants of an imam right so definitely consider uh, thinking about that as you write your code. And now going on to uh, topics that are a little bit more advanced. Uh, I generally just picked one uh, thing that came to my mind kind of like out of like the blue sky. Uh, I didn't really uh, consider other options. Uh, well, there are really, really many different topics that I could have talked about. This seemed like a uh, easy enough to gawk one, uh, and yet it is still fairly obscure that I would technically call it semi-advanced trust. And it is about uh, use of impulse trade. You can use this pattern of impulse, and trade here is a name of the trade of any trade, so it could have been display as we have already covered it could be something like iterator as is uh, seen in this example and here we are using this pattern in a return position so a function return is a impulse iterator uh, and items of these iterators are strings here we implement a fizzbuzz algorithm or a game or a coding challenge i don't know back in a couple of years ago, I heard it being a fairly popular uh, interview challenge. Uh, not so much right now, uh, but still it serves as a very nice uh, example and presentation. And so the problem here is that we want to return an iterator that returns us fizz buzz, buzz, fizz, or a number that is, uh, if it's neither three of those, um, and typically, well, you could try to write an actual name type, which would be something like map. Uh, within it, there would be um, a, a, the range that we are mapping over. But unfortunately, in this specific case, we cannot do that because uh, the map the, the map type includes the type of this closure, uh, which is uh, the convention the transformer of the numbers uh, in the range. And in Rust, you cannot really name the type of the closure. It's, if you see, if you ever see an error method, you will see something like in the uh, point the back as there's gonna be a uh, closure, something, something, uh, there's gonna be probably an address of the closure, something along those lines. Uh, Ultimately, uh, this is not a valid Rust syntax because, well, there's no way to name a closure type in Rust. And so you do have to resort to letting the compiler to figure out what the type is for you. Uh, and that's exactly what the impl iterator here does in this uh, 
specific return position. Uh, but it also like generally uh, really, really helps if you just need to, uh, or just don't want to bother writing down a very long time that you could write down, but you just can't wrap your head around. It would be very verbose or just like really hard to figure out. Um, Impulprate in that case is very nice. Um, similarly, you can put impulprate in an argument position, as, such as I have done here. Uh, this one is a little bit less of a magic. It's just a syntax trigger for uh, introducing a generic. So I could have uh, added iterator as a typical generic to this function. Sorry about that. Uh, and it will work just pretty much the same. Uh, that generic would have been uh, bounded over the iterator that returns the thing. This does pretty much the same. And uh, now in the function body, we can iterate over the values within that iterator and print them out. Uh, so not much of a surprise here. It's just nice knowing that you can do this because it is a little bit more terse than uh, just introducing a generic proper. Uh, and then finally, like I would say using a generic in that function is not necessarily the best idea. And that because uh, in a function called print fizzbuzz, we probably want to be printing fizzbuzz rather than uh, an arbitrary values of an iterator that iterates over the strings, right? Um, but in adding a generic, this is not necessarily what happens. It allows you to pass in any iterator that uh, produces any strings, and it would print out arbitrary stuff for you. Um, so unfortunately, this is a unstable feature. So we are going to uh, op crack open a Pandora's box, a Pandora chest, uh, for a preview of what uh, what in the future might look like. And you do that by using the nightly compiler and adding this uh, feature attribute to equate. In this case, we are using type alias impulse date, uh, which is standing for type alias equals impulse trait. Um, and what this feature does is that it will pick a single type, such as has been done uh, when we were using impulse trait in a return position, such as here, and we are doing the same here, here with fizzbuzz uh, as a return value of the fizzbuzz function. It will figure out the exact type of this, uh, that this function is returning. And then you can refer to that exact type again uh, in the argument position of the print first buzz uh, function. Now it will no longer allow you to pass in the impoliter, any other impoliterator than what has been returned from this first buzz function. Again, this is a fairly, I would say, feature that you probably won't be needing much, especially because it is unstable right now, but it is still something useful uh, keeping in mind as a concern if you are designing an API or something along those lines, like really think about, well, if I'm taking this as an argument, does it really make sense for my library? What will happen if somebody will pass something else than what I expect? Uh, and these kind of concerns are alleviated by uh, impulse sometimes. Other times you may want to introduce a uh, separate type of your own maybe. Uh, that might be even a better option than using uh, type areas in trade in the first place, but well, I wanted to show off uh, unstable list, so this kind of ended up being the uh, example I went with. So, <clears throat> conclusions out of these, uh, uh, out of this section on semi advanced Rust is that Rust is still a fairly new and and a language that evolves uh, fairly quickly still. Uh, you may encounter pain points that are 
potentially about to be solved by a feature that is not yet available to uh, the stable compiler. Um, it does not prevent you from playing with those features. Eventually, you uh, the not one and not two projects out there that just use the nightly compiler for these features because uh, they make your code more expressive, more powerful. You can express safety and variant that are not otherwise possible. There are types you cannot name in Rust, uh, and features there are some. There are some features that deal with that problem, right? Uh, Impulse trait is one of those. Uh, you can potentially uh, try to get out of this situation by using uh, generics in a fairly uh, ingenious way. So, for example, uh, you can. It is possible to return a closure from a function without being able to name it by introducing a generic, but it's really not all that easy to figure out, really. Uh, and might involve things or tricks like having a callback uh, closure in there somewhere. So do keep an eye out for new features uh, to make your code more powerful. And you might notice that a fair number of features in Rust are just a syntax sugar. That is the case for what I demonstrated with Impel uh, trait in the argument position. But also a little bit less intuitively, this also holds true for the for or while loop, which do eventually desugar to like the regular loop. Uh, admittedly, if the Rust compiler does uh, introduce some additional semantic checking over that, but uh, it is a fairly straightforward conversion, really. Just replace the while loop and condition with a regular loop and then a regular if within there that check the same condition and breaks out otherwise if it's not passing. And now for the last stretch of this presentation on some quick miscellaneous tips. Do definitely check out uh, the third party cargo command. Maybe you will find something to augment your workflow, uh, make you more productive. Uh, there are plenty of those on craze.io. Uh, this link lead to a uh, search that you can look at. Maybe you will find something that I have in Discover, for example. Uh, do definitely share if you find something uh, interesting because the ecosystem is always evolving and Tools are getting better and better. And well, my toolbox may have gotten out of date in some amount of time as well. Um, to access documentation uh, in the browser uh, search field, you can just write doc.os slash the Kuwait name. It will open you a page uh, from Docs of Project, which is a part of project maintained by the Rust language. Uh, community. Uh, for the standard library, the create name is std. For the core library, the create name is core. Uh, some create that you may commonly see and use in near core are Sergey, uh, clap, that kind of stuff. Replace the create with that create name and you will immediately end up with uh, documentation for that create most, most recent version too. Uh, do familiarize yourself with the style, uh, style guidelines and as well as the rest of the books uh, within which these guidelines are. Uh, there is a huge amount of very useful information within that book that we uh, keep up to date all the time. So this presentation will eventually potentially end up a little bit stale. Uh, the documentation within that book will uh, stay, out, uh, stay up to date all the time, especially with regard to uh, specifics of development uh, on near core and surrounding quid. And last but not least, if you do have any question, hit some snag, uh, encounter some issue, or just a stuck. Uh, package your code example uh, in a Rust playground and drop drop into like the hashtag Rust stream on Zulip. Uh, and we will definitely be there to help you out.
uh, to look at your code suggest and a best approach for your problem uh, we are definitely open to talking about rust in general like if you have some uh, concerns or you like rust or you found something interesting uh, this team is definitely the one to post and do uh, to share your experiences and that kind of stuff as well and that's all for me unfortunately awesome. there are no so ahead. much <laughs> for presenting to me but now we have it recorded for everybody that was really great thank you so much uh cool thank you for watching